Good afternoon and welcome to the Garrison Town Hall. Here is our agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, with opening remarks, Colonel Holly Martin, Garrison Commander, and Garrison Command Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major James House. All right, so good afternoon. Um, it's been a while since we've all had a chance to talk, um, especially the last three to four months of going into the COVID environment. Uh, so we wanted to take a moment today and talk, talk to all of our employees um, and make sure that we're reaching out and uh, just kind of talking about where we're at and then some of the other things that are pretty standard with our environment to make sure you know what's going on and uh, connect in the way we can right now um, before we go back to a, uh, like a lower health protection condition. Uh, so we wanted to take the time today just to meet with our employees, although virtually and then uh, let you know that we're still here and we're still doing whatever we can to help all of our uh, employees out and, and run the installation. And so I'll turn it over to Sergeant Major for a couple of kind words and uh, looking forward to our discussions today. Uh, as everyone knows, um, we have a lot to talk about and some employees to recognize today as well. So Sergeant Major. Team, thanks for joining us. I know that everybody's busy and everybody has a lot of things to do going on out there to support the garrison and its mission. I uh, just wanted to say thank you again for tuning in with us and we can't wait to get everybody back to work and, and swing by and see everybody so that we can uh, uh, get back on the right foot and uh, can't wait to see everybody. Thank you. Sergeant Major House, Colonel Martin, thank you. Mr. Scott Brown, Director of Plans, Training, Mobilization, and Security, will brief our phased reopening plan and the road ahead. Mr. Brown. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Team Garrison. And just wanted to take a few minutes here and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the process we went through for uh, reopening and uh, what we call in, uh, the new normal. So we worked uh, collectively and collaborative as teams, uh, not only inside the garrison, but with all of our service partners, uh, with CASCOM, uh, the, the, the team that we all was able to get together and do a deliberate uh, mission analysis uh, on restarting uh, the garrison back to what's considered a new normal. Uh, while we did this, we had to take into account what was those key essential uh, functions uh, that we were providing as service providers uh, to ensure that the soldiers have a safe environment uh, and also the uh, employees to work in uh, and also why the soldiers were training. So what we had to ensure that we were nested uh, with the White House, uh, with the uh, uh, reopening plan, uh, also with the Commonwealth of Virginia, Virginia with the governor's plan, and also DOD, OPM, and AMC, MCOM, and, and definitely with the garrison commander, senior commander's guidance uh, as they were applied uh, to the conditions uh, here on Fort Lee uh, in the Fort Lee area of operations. And uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure that we always had kept uh, at the forefront while we're doing this was to ensure that we did not uh, execute any services that will be prohibited by the state. We were bound to stay in line with the executive orders and also local ordinance. Uh, the garrison commander, uh, she made a concerted uh, and deliberate uh, effort uh, to ensure that we uh, met those conditions uh, based all of the decisions on opening on risk-based uh, recommendations to the uh, senior commander and one of the main things we had to always look at was was uh, what we're mitigating uh, and preventing uh, COVID-19 infections uh, from having clusters and outbreaks on the uh, installation. Uh, as we work through that uh, reopening one of the things we look at now is is that we strictly have to enforce physical distancing uh, you guys have been hearing social distancing over and over again. Uh, there's television commercials about it. There's handouts. Uh, you flip your phone on, you'll probably see it there, your computer, and then PPE, that protect, protective gear. We had to ensure that we had the appropriate protective gear for our employees uh, here in the garrison uh, as we're performing our mission. Sanitation. We have to take the time and look at, uh, as we uh, execute those functions, uh, keeping the environment safe and clean uh, is different in every environment. Uh, from food service uh, capabilities to office area. So you have to look at uh, each of those differently uh, when you're working uh, in your individual plans to make that happen. So next slide. So what we had to look at is as we work through all of this is the main thing here is be prepared uh, to reinstate any restrictions on a service if conditions deteriorated 
or we saw conditions not only on the installation or else also in our area of operation uh, that we ensure that we're keeping everyone safe. So the end state in all of this, in short, is, is that the garrison services reestablish and operate a standard with proper measures in place to protect both our employees and our customers. What I want to do right now is, is we'll put on the screen for you the uh, Virginia Phase 1, Phase 2. And uh, just want to talk a little bit about these. So as we first started out and we got the first uh, word to start opening, we had to look at what was the uh, governor telling us that we were authorized to do uh, by being here within the state of Virginia. Then we cross-referenced that with the national plan that was called Reopen America. Then we took all the supplemental guidances that we were receiving from higher headquarters within Department of Defense, Department of the Army, and our higher headquarters, MCOM, AMC, uh, IDT. We had to make sure that we were all in line with that. So some of you remember when we first started out, we were having uh, events of, uh, for retirement or a change of responsibility, change of command. No audiences greater than 10 individuals. Uh, we had to do those virtually. So some of the things now that we have is now we're allowed to go out to a maximum social gathering of 50 people. Now, what that means is you don't have 50 people clustered together, but you take that and you still apply social distancing, you still apply PPE where it's appropriate uh, in those areas, and then you look at is the event can hold 50 people. So if you have a venue that does not let you allow 50 people to properly social distance, does not mean you do an event with 50 people within that uh, arena. Local businesses, as we looked at how things were opening outside the gate, we took a deliberate pause here between the garrison commander and senior commander to ensure that we can assess conditions outside the gate. And from that, when we looked at that, we realized that we were now able to open up things like our golf course snack bar, our sustainers pub uh, snack area, our bowling alley snack bar, AFI's uh, main uh, uh, concessionaire areas, uh, also inside of Burger King. Uh, looking at those on how we can do that. An example would be Popeyes. Popeyes has the ability on any given day to clearly have more than 42 people inside the facility at any given time. However, with taking it, uh, into account social distancing, giving the, those workers there a safe working environment, the customers an ability to, uh, uh, to go there and enjoy their meal, we're able to look at, well, that maybe that number is only 42. So AFES did a good job in looking at those things across the board. Fitness centers, that was one of the biggest things that we were being asked to open was fitness centers. We initially started out with DFMWR and the Strength Performance Center. They did a great job in preparing the Strength Performance Center to accept those uh, patrons to come in and have a place to exercise uh, under those conditions. Since then, the governor has said you can have 30%. So with that, DFMWR once again did a great job with their team, marking off equipment, uh, having their uh, sanitation clean teams uh, as they go out and uh, work through different pieces of equipment as individuals come off the equipment, utilizing a mask when a mask is appropriate and not having a mask on when a mask is not appropriate. So those are just some of the things that we went through uh, as we worked through. One of the other critical ones that I'll close with was dealing with uh, child development centers. Uh, the governor had opened them up for uh, key and essential employees. Outside the gate, that would have been things like law enforcement, firefighters, our medical providers who are definitely out on the front lines in our nation, uh, grocery store workers. So those were the kind of individuals that first looked at that. So we had to take a step back and look at what did that mean for us here at Fort Lee. Well, we know the reason why we're here is those young men and women that raise their hand that is wearing this uniform to defend this nation. So we had to look at who was servicing that area in order for us to look at how we can successfully open that up. Once again, Tamara Johnson and her team at DFMWR did a great job on looking at what was phase one uh, to reopen called Top 50. And we were able to have successfully 88 positions for the young children and 62 for school age children. And that was successfully pulled off here on the uh, 15th of this month. And I said I was going to close with the last one, but I'll be remiss if I do not end with this one. On 7 June, we were able to open up our worship services, our religious support team. Once again, another great job, DFMWR, 
I apologize, DPW working with RSO uh, to prepare those facilities from both external to internal, and then the RSO team working uh, in-house with their teams to get the place ready to go. So our uh, individuals that were coming here to worship had a safe environment to hear the word and to also have that spiritual connection uh, that they had been so desired to have. So I just want to say thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes to talk about the reopening with the garrison, and I look forward to coming back to you and talking to you again about hurricane season. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. On more than one occasion, unit commanders and senior leaders have said the presentation of awards is one of the privileges of command. Today, we begin with the Length of Service Awards. Completing five years of service from DES, Mr. Raymond Ramirez. Also from DES with 10 years of service, Mr. Benjamin Clifford. After 20 years of service to the nation, Mr. Kevin Hamill with DES and Mr. Vic Hines with DPTMS. With a quarter century of government service, Mr. Jason Sklute of PAIO. From DPTMS and RMO, respectively, Ms. Sonia Price and Ms. Kathy Martin have each dedicated 35 years of service to the nation. Mr. Victor Estrada of DFMWR has served our nation for 40 years. Finally, remarkably and marvelously, from DFMWR, Mr. Edmund Manuel has devoted 50 years, that's one half century of service to the United States of America. At this time, we ask Mr. Steve Hollis to please join the command team. Uh, attention to orders. Uh, this is a Achievement Medal for Civilian Service presented to Stephen D. Hollis. Um, it, it says, for winning Garrison Civilian of the Quarter for second quarter, fiscal year 2020, Steve played an instrumental role in the movement of advanced in initial training soldiers from Fort Lee to their first units of assignment. His negotiations with the Human Resources Command were so successful, they resulted in extended report dates across the Army, which facilitated movement for thousands of soldiers and significantly reduced the holdover population. Steve's efforts improved military readiness by building the overall strength of the Army. His accomplishments, dedication, and exemplary performance are in keeping with the highest traditions of government service and reflect great credit upon him, the United States Army Garrison Fort Lee, the Installation Management Command, and the United States Army. So, Mr. Hollis, congratulations, and um, I'll give you the virtual handshake, and uh, we will set this back on the table, but thank you for all you do. It's a privilege to recognize you today for all that you've done for the organization. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to present this to you today. So congrats. Thank you. Mr. Kelly Hennant of the Garrison Safety Office will now provide a COVID-19 safety brief followed by a summer safety brief. Hi, right, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Hennant from the Garrison Safety Office. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about two things, how to protect ourselves from the COVID-19 virus, and then we'll jump into summer safety. First off, social distancing. What is social distancing? That's being able to maintain that, that six feet of distance between individuals, works inside or outside. Next slide. Some of the other things that we wanna do is cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, the way that we do that, wear disposable gloves when you're cleaning and disinfecting. Clean the surfaces daily with soap and water or disinfectant. Use diluted household bleach solutions where appropriate. Focus on frequently touched areas, uh, such as doorknobs, tables, light switches. Clean those every day. Uh, consider using a designated line trash can, and after you use that, your cleaning supplies, your rags, your uh, gloves, throw those in that liner and dispose of appropriately. For soft surfaces, uh, such as carpets, floors, use appropriate cleaners and disinfectants. Uh, wash clothing and bed linens often, using detergent and warm uh, water. 
Wear gloves when handling laundry from an ill or infected person. Do not shake that laundry. Uh, this could dis, uh, disperse that virus through the air. Uh, clean and disinfect your hampers when emptying them, uh, after you empty them. Avoid sharing personal items such as towels and blankets. Next slide. Wash hands frequently. Most importantly, if you're ill, stay at home. Cover your cough, no, using your elbow to cover your cough instead of your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Next slide. Face coverings. Well, we've all seen them by, by this point in time. Um, use your face covering when you're unable to maintain that six feet of distance. All individuals, unless restricted by age or physical ability, should be wearing one. Wear it when you go to the PX, to the commissary, all the academic and admin buildings. Uh, when you're unable to maintain that six feet of distance, uh, wear a mask. So if you're inside of a vehicle, uh, only two of you inside the vehicle, you're less than six feet, at least one of you should be wearing the, the mask, preferably not the driver, particularly if he's wearing glasses, because we know that condensation builds on the glasses, want everybody to be safe. Uh, it's not recommended uh, to wear a mask when you're at home with your own family, while you're driving your POV uh, with your family members inside the vehicle. While outside doing PT, yard work, recreation, or when social distance can be maintained. Next slide. Use a cloth mask. Now you've seen those made from t-shirts, bandanas, or other soft material. Leave the N95 or surgical mask for the medical professionals, first responders, those who need them the most. Your mask sh should fit snug, but comfortable around the ears or tied behind the head, not under your chin, on top of your head, not with your nose exposed. Um, mask could be made of multiple uh, layers of cloth, but not so thick that you can't breathe, that you have to pull hard to, to draw your breath in. Should be able to launder it frequently. So you might want to have more than one. Uh, minimize adjustments to this mask. You know, wear it behind your ears or tied behind your head. Uh, minimize adjustments so you're not touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. And as soon as you remove it, your mask, go ahead and go wash your hands. Next slide. Now for the fun stuff. Summer is here, even though it snuck up on us, um, and we're not fully able to fully enjoy summer, but it's here. Next slide. So we want to talk to you uh, about a few safety do's and don'ts regarding summer. When you're bar you know, barbecuing, outside grilling, keep a fire extinguisher, bucket of water handy. Never leave that grill unattended when you you open your gas grill to light, leave that lid open. Don't let the gas build up inside and then try to light it. And don't stand over top of your burners while you light this. Uh, some grills and other uh, outdoor cooking devices require electricity. Use the appropriate extension cord for these. Next slide. Swimming. Never swim alone. Be aware of your own capabilities. In the environment that you're in, such as a pool, river, lake, ocean, all these have different uh, hazards to be, uh, all of them have a different hazard associated with them. Of course, with children, all, always supervise those children. Next slide. Rip currents. They're frequently encountered in Virginia and North Carolina, which personnel from Fort Lee normally frequent. Virginia coastline is beautiful as well as the North Carolina coastline. What they have in common is rip currents. They're very uh, severe in this area and they, they occur often. Watch the lifeguard stations for the warning flags. It would tell you when rip cur currents are, cur are present or when the conditions are, are, when the conditions are correct for the rip currents. If you do find yourself caught in one, 
remain calm. Panic and fatigue is normally what contributes to somebody drowning from a rip, rip current. Next slide. Heat stress. Limit your physical activities. Seek shade and water, water, water. Can't stress that enough. Uh, hydrate yourself. Next slide. Boating. Know your boat and its capability. Be aware of the weather. Uh, surrounding uh, those, the other boats surrounding you, keep your head on swivel. There's many people that's irresponsible boaters out there, and some of them may be impaired. So be responsible for your boat, your crew, the personnel on your boat, and watch out for the others. Next slide. Fireworks. Know what the state laws are, and if you're going to another state, know what those state laws are uh, regarding fireworks. Always best to leave fireworks to the professionals. Avoid the, hey, watch this scenario. That's what we normally see on the uh, America's Funniest Videos or the Darwin Awards later on. Next slide. Defensive driving and riding. Remember drinking and driving, texting, or other distractions is never okay. Traffic has begun picking up after this long decline during early stages of pandemic response. Also, motorcycles are out in full force as well. We all need to watch out for each other, cyclists, pedestrians, and drivers. Next slide. During the warmer months, many people start to think about riding motorcycles. There are requirements, responsibilities that go along with that, especially for service members. Here are some of the resources available. Next slide. Summer sports. Wear the appropriate gear for activity you're performing. Know your own limitations. Limit alcohol use. Watch for heat injury signs on yourself and on others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hennon. Hurricane season is defined as June 1st through November 30th. Mr. Scott Brown will provide a hurricane assessment. Once again, thank you for uh, spending the time with us here and uh, giving us a few moments to talk about uh, the upcoming, uh, currently, uh, current hurricane season. And uh, before I start out, I just have to say thank you to uh, Mr. Thomas uh, Loden, our emergency manager who uh, ensures every year uh, that we get the appropriate information when it comes to uh, what is the Atlantic uh, hurricane season going to look like. I just get the easy part uh, to be the talking head, but he does all the hard work behind it. So I want to make sure I give a shout out to Tom Loden for that. Uh, next slide. So what we want to look at here is that if you notice, uh, it said we're going to have a little bit above normal hurricane season. And that's exactly what we're seeing so far. We've had four named storms uh, up to this point. And if you look at the bottom uh, of our slide where it talks about named storms, where it talked about we would have seven to 12 named storms. Well, we're well on our way uh, with four named storms already in uh, this hurricane season. So basically, uh, uh, we'll continue to keep an eye out on uh, uh, the uh, storm tracks uh, that we receive from uh, NOAA weather. Uh, then we'll also ensure that uh, we provide adequate and timely information uh, as we work through uh, this hurricane season. Next slide. So what does that mean for impacts uh, to Fort Lee? Well, we know that Fort Lee, uh, when we look at it, we take our area of operation, we not only just look at Fort Lee proper, but we have to also go as far east as our Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach uh, employees and soldiers and contractors and family members. We also take it and uh, go south. Uh, we go south, we go down to the state line and look at what's coming uh, from the North Carolina uh, side. We also also take a look at this and we go west and we look at uh, the mountains. Uh, the mountains plays a big factor uh, in weather. So with that, we see storm surge. Uh, that's primarily in our uh, Hampton Roads area, but we do get flooding. Uh, here in the local areas. Uh, rainfall, heavy rainfall, definitely comes with, uh, with hurricanes. Next part, high winds. We know that we're gonna get high winds off, of, uh, off the storm. So what does that mean uh, when you have high winds uh, 
Uh, you have uh, trees that fall. You have uh, objects uh, that uh, fly around. If you don't bring your trash cans in, your lawn furniture, your children's trampolines. Uh, those, are, those are some major uh, dangers and hazards uh, that we have to look at. Then you must also, uh, when you have a hurricane, is be cognizant of tornadoes because you do have the ability to have tornadoes to spin off of, of hurricanes. So we keep all that in mind as uh, impacts to uh, Fort Lee area. So when we look at that uh, minor flooding in this area, high winds, down trees, power outages, uh, road closures, we know that Fort Lee um, traditionally with storms at Fort Lee, uh, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, uh, we normally have been able to get ourselves back up operational uh, to some capacity with the hard work from uh, DPW's team and also the local uh, service providers uh, outside the gate to come on in the installation. However, in your subdivisions and things of that nature, uh, you're not as lucky, you're not as fortunate. Uh, we've had uh, outages uh, in those areas uh, upwards to 13, 14, 15 days uh, in some of the subdivisions, uh, down trees, power lines, uh, things of that nature. So that takes into account when we move into the next slide, when we're talking about the Tri-Cities area, Fort Lee once again. Uh, so I won't repeat these uh, because I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, we look at the regional impacts, but once again, you see the same thing, flooding, road closures, tornadic activities, uh, things of that nature. Okay, next slide. Command considerations. Just like when I was here a few minutes ago, we were talking about as we were reopening or calling uh, the new normal. We got to look at the mission essential functions. What does that take uh, to keep Fort Lee up and operational uh, uh, post, uh, uh, pre-storm, uh, during, and then post-storm? So we have to uh, take a look at those. Key and essential personnel. Uh, we also have an early release delayed opening uh, uh, event cancellation type policy uh, that we work off of when we're uh, making those decisions. We also look at uh, other folks that we're required to support uh, in time of an emergency. If we have to stand up the operations center, bringing in uh, the LNOs, we also look at uh, if we have to be considered an installation staging base. Uh, we've been uh, tagged to do that in the past, uh, where we've had several hundred uh, of our great American uh, citizens to come in uh, and work through uh, hurricane activities for actions that are within the Virginia, the state of Virginia, and also uh, south of Virginia, and they stage from this area. Uh, 72 hours. I'll talk a little bit more about what's key about 72 hours. But, this, but one thing we do look at here is our ability to have a location uh, for family members uh, to go if they're without power, and power to cell phones, uh, you know, maybe warm up some baby formula, uh, power up a computer or a tablet or something of that nature. So we have that ability, and we'll let them know where that particular location is uh, that they can go and uh, execute that type of uh, uh, action if they need to to help with their family. Next slide, preparedness actions. A lot of great websites. Won't get into all of these. You have them on the slide. Take the time to go and look at them you know, Ready Army, you know, ready.gov. Take a look and really look at these. The one I will highlight is alerts. Alerts is our ability to communicate with you when you're not at your office. Even while you're in your office, we can communicate with you through alerts. But alerts is the ability to send you a text message. We can send you a phone call. We can send you an email. Those are the things that uh, we look at is that majority of the time when you're having a storm, you're not here at work sitting at your desk. You're usually at home. It's in the middle of the night. Uh, for some reason, it seemed like hurricanes and uh, uh, tornadoes seem to like the nighttime activity. Uh, don't ask me why, but it seems that they like to have that. So we want to make sure we can reach out to you, give you appropriate information, timely information uh, by utilizing uh, that system. All right, next slide. Pre-storm. I just talked about alerts. We got it highlighted in red. Mask warning notification system. Well, we can sound the sirens if we need to, if we have tornadic activity. We can also uh, sound the sirens to give you some uh, general alerts. We have internal voice within some buildings on post. We can send you a message inside the building. But once again, I just want to hone in on that alerts is that ability to communicate. So that's on the installation side. We look at tenant organizations. What we ask you to do, tighten up your motor pools, tighten up your training areas, things that will become a projectile. Let's go ahead and put those in an environment. Tie them down. Take them and put them inside a building. Uh, go and relook at your continuity of operations plan on how you would execute within your own organization. 
Uh, so those are the things we want you to kind of look at. Individuals, this goes for all of us, not just the individuals that live off post, but pr mainly also on post. When you take that 72 hours, take the time prior to the storm, get those key and essential items back at your house, flashlights with batteries. Ensure you may have the little backup battery chargers for your cell phones in case you lose power and you didn't have the ability to plug it in and uh, utilize that. Look at the uh, non-perishable items to have uh, at your home so you're not opening your refrigerator and your freezer. I'll give you a tip that uh, I could never figure it out as a young man when my dad uh, would always take old empty one gallon milk jugs and fill them up and freeze them and throw them in the freezer. And I'd be like, man, why is he doing that? But then as you got older and you realize and you ask the question, you realize that if you lose power or whatever, you got that inside of that deep freeze that he had out there in the garage and had the ability to keep things cold. And you could also thaw it out. And guess what? You got some cold drink of water at the same time. Thought I'd leave you with that tip. Next slide. Storm responsibilities during. The main one that our law enforcement love for us to take heed to. Stay put. If you are in a safe environment, stay put. You don't have where you have a tree fell on your home. You don't have wind damage that tore off your roof or something of that nature. You're in a safe environment. Stay put. We don't want our law enforcement and our first responders to put themselves in any additional danger to respond when an individual can stay put. So please take the time to do that. Uh, have that communications tree where you back with your employees, your soldiers, your family members. Have that plan on how you're going to communicate uh, with each other. So those are some of the things we want everyone to understand. Just shelter in place while we're going through that. Next slide, post-storm. Another very important one. Take a look around your home as an individual. Take a look around your house. Make sure you don't have any uh, issues with the foundation. The roof is still fine. You don't have a water leak. You don't have a gas line leak. You transfer that same type of information back to the tenant organization. You look at who you have as your facility manager. Understand who's going to be the first one back in your organization and take a look. You know, do I have a cracked water line? You know, is it, I got a gas leak? Is the foundation cracked? Understand, walk through that facility, and if you have an issue with that, call in the service order appropriately so that we can make sure that we have the damage recovery teams to come out and take a look at that. Next slide. Debris removal. This is very important. We know we're going to have, during a hurricane, we're going to have tree branches, down trees, leaves everywhere, items all over the place. So this is where we tap into all of us working together, both on the installation, off the installation, safely cleaning up behind uh, the storm so that we can ensure that we can have a speedier recovery. Here are some very important phone numbers uh, that you can call. Uh, so that you have points of contact uh, when you are uh, lead of uh, assistance uh, when dealing with a storm. The one thing I will point out when dealing with debris removal is if you have down power lines and things of that nature, please stay away from those. Uh, we have seen in the past where individuals, uh, you may have a down power line, well guess what, power is still live in that power line. So it's not a toy, it's not a game to see if you can bounce on them. Be safe and always be cautious when uh, doing that. So at this point in time, I just want to say thank you once again for allowing me to provide uh, a little bit of update. Uh, the, the state of Virginia will always come out with its, uh, 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 what you call a hurricane uh, sales no tax day. Uh, that's a very important day to uh, go and get items uh, that can help you with the storm. You don't have to pay taxes on it. Once again, Garrison, uh, fellow uh, Garrison employees, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to what we had to present to you, and as always, committed to service. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Chris Anthony, representing the Directorate of Human Resources, will provide an update now to workforce development opportunities. Good afternoon. I am Chris Anthony, the Workforce Development Specialist. Um, during these trying times, the good news for Garrison folks are that there's still opportunities for professional development. As you see there on the slides there, there's the EEL, which we already have received a few um, we received a few uh, different um, applications and we also are looking for more um, EEL OCs for the GS 13s and 14 levels so if you're interested send me an email and I'll send you the application um, also there we have the FERS benefit and retirement seminar on the 25th and the 26th of August we already have a like 
50 employees already signed up and about 10 spouses, but we still have more room. So if you're interested, go ahead and send me an email. And I always say when you're, when you're looking at this, it's not a, you're not going there to retire. This is just to learn your benefits, learn how the TSP works, your Social Security, long-term investments. There's a lot of things that's going on. Everybody has a positive outcome from this seminar. So if you're interested, again, send me an email and we'll get you um, an invite. Um, the next one there, um, the emotional intelligent one, that is one that's coming out through the CP29. Uh, and that's a free online course. If you're interested in that, send me an email and I'll get you that. And the last thing I wanted to add there was the, the CES. With these, everything is changing now. All the classes are going to virtual uh, and the classroom. So a lot of times people can't go to the resident portion of the CES because of family members or because of certain things that are happening with their life. So this time they give you the opportunity to go to a virtual classroom. So that's why they now there's, everything is opening up for CES to go virtual classrooms. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Allen will now provide an update to our religious services opportunities. Hello, Fort Lee. and. Uh... Glad to have this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our religious worship services. As of June the 7th, all of our chapels are now open and we have services in all chapels. Uh, we are operating at 50% capacity right now. We ask if you come that you do bring a mask. We want our folks to wear masks and we're practicing social distancing uh, with folks sitting six feet apart. Obviously, if your family's with you, you can sit with your family. Uh, but we have services in all three of our chapels. We're asking all Protestant AIT service members to attend the reload and resupply service in the units. Only those who are distinctive religious faith group folks are allowed to come to the, the Islamic service, the, the uh, bilingual service, the Catholic service, and the um, pagan service and the LDS service. Those soldiers can get transportation from their units to come to those services. The buses are not running uh, during this phase of our operation, but we'll hopefully uh, get those back in the coming weeks. But until then, we're asking each of the units to provide uh, transportation to soldiers to come to our services. If you have any questions at all, about our services, our service schedule. We're, we have a Facebook page, the Relig uh, Fort Lee Religious Support Facebook page, or you can call our office at 734-6494, and we look forward to seeing all of you in our services real soon. Thanks. Thank you, Chaplain. At this time, Mr. Bob Edwards, acting deputy to the garrison commander, will address questions from the workforce gathered through the commander's advisory group. The first question we have from our workforce. When we start returning to work, will employees at high risk or with family members at high risk in their homes be allowed to continue teleworking, providing they can accomplish their jobs from home? The answer is a two-part. Uh, no, high-risk employees may be asked to return to work with 50% teleworking, 50% coming to work. Uh, we looked at CDC guidance as high-risk personnel return to work wear a mask in a sanitized workplace and practice social distancing. Uh, so we have sufficient amount of uh, masks for all of our employees that return to work. We have sanitized uh, 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 for 50 gallon, uh, no, not 50 gallon, but we have sanitizers uh, for a plenty to go around we can, and ordering more. Uh, social distancing is why we're looking at 50% teleworking and 50% coming back to work. And currently, just because we're talking about this, that doesn't mean that we're going to be doing that uh, in this current work environment. So that, that is a future answer. Currently, we're still maintaining teleworking as we started. Uh, so that is a future answer when we start coming back to work. No employees with high-risk families may be asked to return to work with 50% teleworking and 50% coming to work. Employees can practice sanitizer procedures similar to the medical personnel, leave shoes in the garage or porch, or porch and go directly to a shower and wash clothes. 
The second question we have from our workforce, when are the fitness facilities opening back up for everyone? They are. So effective 8 June, the Strength Performance Center, ALU, and Ordinance and uh, Rec Facilities reopened for active duty and first responders only. Effective uh, Monday, 15 June, McLaughlin Clark uh, Fitness Centers reopened for all authorized patrons, military, DOD civilians, retirees, and their families. Our third question from the workforce, why are we required to wear a mask at the gym? We're asking you to wear a mask while moving around uh, the facility and keep in compliance with the governor's uh, executive order 65. And signs are posted in the fitness center concerning masks and covering requirements. So when you're exercising, you're not required to wear a mask, but as you're moving around, uh, not keeping social distance, passing people and that stuff, then wear your mask. The fourth question coming in, now that corporate businesses in the state of Virginia and military installations are slowly coming to a normal operation in that they've reopened businesses, Fort Lee has encouraged employees to return to work with restrictions. Now, it's uh, said that Fort Lee had a no telework rule in effect uh, with the garrison. So will the garrison lift that ban on no teleworking after the COVID epidemic and permit employees case by case to perform their job from home? Currently, uh, only situation in teleworking is approved at this time. That discussion will be uh, discussed in the future as we go back to normal. So currently, only situation teleworking is approved at this time. Question five. I have a newly born grandchild in Texas I'd like to see now. What government arrangements must be made to get this done? Request leave. Uh, and once leave is approved you, and, and, and you take leave, uh, before you return to work, uh, the supervisor will ask you four questions. Uh, have you contacted anyone, been in contact with anyone with COVID-19? Do you feel sick? Do you have a fever or flu-like systems? And then the mode of travel exception is uh, how did you travel? Uh, so if all those questions are no, you can re return to work. If any of those questions are has a yes, then you self-quarantine 14 days. And uh, you should have a, a return to work flow chart that, that has that, uh, that procedure already in place. So you can go to Texas, see your child, or you can go see your, your mother that's sick. But uh, when you return to work, you're going to follow those, those rules right there. Number six, due to the virus impacting businesses and in turn reduced federal tax dollars collected, when might offers of Vera and VSIP commence? There's no VSIP for FY20. Uh, VSIPs will be offered if in the future we have reductions. There's no reductions currently for FY20. And go there. All right. Question seven, will the garrison commander have a farewell golfing event prior to her retirement? Depends on the COVID situation. There is ability to hold a golf event with social distancing and the logistics and working out an award event of completion of the golf event that meets the gathering rule for non-official events. So maybe. Question number eight. Can individual directorates give Colonel Martin a farewell gift without putting the garrison over the limit for presentations? This is the legal answer. Uh, yes, the value of PCS ETS gifts should not normally exceed 300 per donating group. Although there is no definition in the JR for donating group, it is proper for each identifier group or discrete organization to present a gift as separate donation donating group. If any donations to to more than donate group, the, the groups are aggregated for purpose of determining the 300 limits. So if you keep it at the directorate level, then we're keeping uh, that group thing separate and so each director can, can provide a gift if they want. Number nine, what are Colonel Martin's expectations for the continuity book being created for the incoming garrison commander? When is our input due? PAO will collect the data from each director's staff element. Directors will use previous versions DGC and GC continuity slash smart book as a template. Key data will be organization chart, mission, top three actions, 
another specific data, IE budget status for RM. Uh, TASHA will go out this week, and if infor and information is due to PAIO on 10 July. Number 10, not so much a question, but more of a statement and a good one to part on. Thank you, Colonel Martin, for your service to our nation. Very much appreciated. We'll now turn things over to Colonel Martin for closing remarks. So, uh, first of all, uh, this is a lot of information and a lot of great information. I hope I get to talk to everyone again before I do leave out in August. Um, but for those who I might not get to say anything to, uh, I just, I really am humbled and honored to have been able to command the Fort Lee Garrison here. Uh, this has been a huge opportunity for me, uh, opportunity of a lifetime, I will tell you. And I would say probably the best job I've ever had in the Army. Uh, and that's because of you all. Uh, the employees that I've gotten to serve with here, uh, it's been a huge growth opportunity for me as a person, not just as a leader in the military. But um, I feel like this was a, a huge opportunity in terms of growth as, as a pers on a personal and professional note. Um, and so I truly have appreciated my time here, uh, working with everyone, and it's just really been fantastic for me. Um, you know, we don't always get to work with civilians, and I am so grateful I got the opportunity to do so. Um, it kind of grounds you more as an officer and as a person, and I've been really appreciative just of all the, the time and the, just the relationships um, built across the installation, um, especially with our directors and the employees here. And I. I I never really knew what garrisons did, uh, but I do now. And I learn something new every day. Um, it's been an incredible uh, two years, especially with the housing, all the things that have gone on um, with that. And, then, and I, I'll say my thank yous for later, um, but the big thank yous. Um, but just really the mentorship and all of the leadership from our directors and our supervisors who have who may not have been directors, but they've kind of brought me into the fold in terms of being the subject matter experts. Um, and that's every everyone down to the, you know, um, the Iraqo, PAO. I mean, everybody's taught me a little bit, um, and some have taught me a lot more than others um, just because of my comfort zones. And, and I can tell you installations, there there is no comfort zone for a tactical commander um, for someone as myself who spent most of my career in um, combat logistics units um, and did a lot of planning operations type of jobs. And so this was um, just a huge opportunity and I, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Uh, I really valued my time, um, not just with the Army, but uh, at Fort Lee. This is the home of sustainment and uh, just thanks for everything. Sergeant Major. Just to echo what the colonel said, you know, this is a this is a great environment that we work in, and, and we have a lot of great employees that, that do a lot of great things that uh, a lot of times don't get the recognition that they deserve. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, we hope that you know that we can't we can't be successful without you guys out there. So we absolutely appreciate everything that you've done for us, and, and I look forward to you know I still have another year here. I look forward to uh, you know uh, going going again, and uh, we'll push through without Colonel Martin as as difficult as that may be, but. Uh, you know, she's got bigger and better things to move on to, and, and we will miss her. This concludes our town hall. Thank you for joining.